But first, Adam, let's go to you on this one. We spoke on the podcast last Friday when it looked very much like Mason Greenwood would indeed return as a Manchester United player. Fair to say a fair bit has happened since then. So just just bring us up to speed. Yeah, so I suppose, um, I think by now most people will know that you know, Manchester United had a plan to bring Mason Greenwood back to the first team when that then became public knowledge on across Wednesday, Thursday, Friday last week and further details of the extent of those plans. You know, when you think about things such as, for example, even preparing what kind of photographs should be taken of Mason Greenwood during training sessions in order to filter it in a positive way to the public and help shape public perception um, and other details like, you know, preparing exactly what kind of answers Eric Ten Hag, the manager, should have, not only initially, but also short term, medium term and, and beyond. Um, I think that really underpinned the extent of the planning and it led to, the, as you say, this huge backlash. You had members of parliament, uh, charities that specialise in in supporting women who, who have experienced violence, um, were very, very critical of Manchester United and a, and a kind of tidal wave of pressure within the club as well because you had staff members who were really considering their, their positions and their futures at the club um, as a result of United's handling of the matter and that all led to crisis meetings on Friday night in which United's uh, most senior decision makers eventually decided, uh, mostly Richard Arnold, the chief executive, to, to row back on this plan to bring Mason Greenwood back. And that was communicated to the public on Monday afternoon, three statements, which all came out pretty much simultaneously. Mm -hmm. You had a statement from the club, you had a, a, an open letter from Richard Arnold, and you also had Mason Greenwood himself and the decision was that Mason Greenwood remained contracted to Manchester United as as things stand, but a decision's been taken that it's in his best interests to move somewhere else, to continue his career away from the club. United attributed this to the harsh spotlight of life at Manchester United. Yeah, thanks for that, mate. Um, Sarah, I know you've written about this Mason Greenwood uh, situation in, in The Athletic, and we'll talk about that in, in just a second, but uh, Adam just highlighted three statements um, were released early on this week, and these statements publicly have hit criticism, some confusing information amongst all three of them. What were your thoughts when you read them? Yeah, they were, I mean, they were long, um, <laughs> and, and they were also, like you said, very conflicting, and they, and they left... I think more questions than answers. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people um, who were um, upset by the way that Manchester United have handled this would have read the statements and and not really felt any better about it, even though Manchester United have come to the decision that that those people would have wanted. Um, the way that they've come to it and the way that they've communicated it has just has just left people, I think, a little bit confused you know that they're, they're saying that they believe and they have evidence that mason greenwood has not uh, committed any of the things he was charged with and which he obviously denied and had charges the charges were all dropped um but there are also words like cleared um which uh are difficult because he wasn't technically it's kind of factually cleared. incorrect really criminally yeah, <laughs> yeah in the the, the the charges were dropped he wasn't he was never cleared the case never went to trial mm. um and that you know united also say or i think richard arnold said that they had access to certain evidence but not all evidence you know they were limited in their powers of investigation and yet they have decided that he is innocent but even so he's not going to stay at the club like adam said because for for his own sake to take him out of the mm. the glare of the spotlight so it doesn't yeah it the statements don't really sort of help anybody, I don't think. Um, no, it was, it was a pretty bizarre thing where you have basically Manchester United, it almost felt as though <laughs> they'd kind of kept much of what the statement would have been if he'd mm. stayed at the club, but kind of tacked on to the end. But actually, because of the harsh spotlight of life, they may as well have added, because of you know what's happened over the past few days in terms of a media reaction, we, we've kind of had no choice but to come to this decision. And... I, I, <laughs> I think, as Sarah says, you know, United all along this process have been referring to partial evidence that's been in the public domain. Um, and what they're essentially asking the general public here is to is to think, well, Manchester United know more than us and therefore we should trust Manchester United on this. And, you know, on the one hand, some people will see that and say, yeah, mm -hmm. OK, you know, they can't say absolutely everything. Some maybe for legal reasons, maybe for reasons of privacy. Um, I think other people will find that very difficult to accept given the damning 
audio and images that have been in the public domain. I think people, a lot of people would have wanted more substantial explanations. And as I say, Manchester United may be trapped in terms of what they're actually able to disclose publicly. So I say that for, for interest of balance. But it mm -hmm. makes me think it was always a borderline impossible task, particularly when you have, and this is a far more broader observation, a club where the ownership is completely mistrusted by both the supporters and the general public. If you're asking to take the club's word on something as big as this, I don't think that relationship is there in order to do so. Yeah, as Adam just pointed out, Sarah, it's very hard to unsee or unhear the footage that, that was out publicly. Um, it's fair to say that if, as an employer, you are setting a standard of what you will accept or not accept, regardless of what else might be happening around it, which we might not be privy to, you have an obligation to set a president as an employer of the standards in which the club operate on. Yeah, I think the statement referred to standards and values at Manchester United, which was a really interesting phrase to include when you're talking about a situation like this. Um, and when we know that their initial intention was to bring Mason Greenwood back, um, what standards and values exactly are you standing by there? I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, this is Manchester United. I, I think any employer anywhere in the world, you know, should have morals and, and ethics that they stand by and, and values that they want their employers, their employees to stand by. But when it's something as um, as public and as global and as popular in basic terms as Manchester United, then then those standards have to be they have to be high mm. because there are millions of people watching your every every move. Mm. There are children idolizing those players and everything that they do and imitating things that they do on the pitch. So, you know, consequently, you, you have to you have to hold them to high standards. I know that some people say footballers shouldn't be held to any higher standards than the rest of us. But I think we all know that, that in reality, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I usually get very queasy when people start talking about, you know, footballers as role models and, and the level of scrutiny that can sometimes be applied unfairly to footballers. I think in this instance, because what you're asking people to do or Manchester United supporters to do if you bring Mason Greenwood back is not only to accept or tolerate that decision, you're asking people to celebrate, to cheer, to potentially sing the person's name. And I think when an image has been so irreparably damaged, that is an extraordinary thing to, to actually ask people to do. And that's where I think it, it does get into that realm of broader, broader significance. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm not saying that football supporters across you know, across the world, sing the names of deeply flawed, uh, deeply flawed characters. Have historically, right? Historically, mm -hmm. continually, right? Probably even to th to this day, you'll still have players from previous generations mm -hmm. whose names are sung and whatever. But I think in, in 2023, yeah, it, there was always going to there was always going to be some people in this case who thought the audio was the beginning and the end of the story, mm. right? Because of how difficult that is to unhear, and the images are so difficult to unsee. That pro that could have been the beginning and the end. I know that's what sort of my colleague Danny Taylor was writing a few months ago, just mm -hmm. saying, how do you get past that? The once Manchester United went past that, that is when it became a quagmire for them, because that's when they decided, for some reason, to try and adjudicate as though they are the police, the CPS, the judge, and the jury, none of which they are qualified to do. You know that is not their day job, and try and come to a verdict on charges that had been dropped uh, and that to me set the set them a standard that was that, that was always going to make this 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 process flawed mm. because if you're trying to prove offenses then you're, you're trying to prove it almost a beyond reasonable doubt mm. whereas i think a more employer relationship is arguably more based on balance of probabilities and also whether it is suitable and appropriate for this person to represent your company, rather than attempting to prove this person did or did not do certain things. Mm. 